As always, it's a joy to be with you tonight, and we trust that each one of us will be encouraged and challenged as we read from God's living word together. We're in Genesis chapter 9, um, so let's select some verses to read and then to begin our study. Genesis 9, verse 1, then God blessed Noah. What a wonderful start to a chapter. God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, all the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food, just as I have given you grain and vegetables. But you must never eat any meat that still has the lifeblood in it. Verse 5, and I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die die. Verse 11, yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will flood waters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I'm giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds. Verse 18, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark with their father were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. From these three sons of Noah came all the people who now populate the earth. After the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he had made and he became drunk and lay naked inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, backed into the tent to cover their father. And as they did this, they looked the other way so they would not see him naked. When Noah woke from his stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. Then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Then Noah said, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed. And may Canaan be his servant. May God expand the territory of Japheth. May Japheth share the prosperity of Shem. And may Canaan be his servant. Noah lived another 350 years after the great flood. He lived 950 years, and then he died. Trust the Lord will speak to each one of us again tonight as we come to another chapter full of detail. And apologies if I don't cover everything tonight. We've tried to suggest in the notes the various things that are there. But right at the start, we recognize we've left the time of judgment. God's judgment for sin is over. What a wonderful thought that is for you and I tonight. And so they step out into a new world and they enter into a new covenant. And that speaks volumes to my heart tonight because everyone who is in Jesus Christ has become a new creation, not in their own effort or ability. 2 Corinthians 5 is so clear, isn't it? The old has gone. The new has come to who? To those who are in Christ. 
That is the key thing. So this shines us forward to our wonderful salvation that we have today. Then secondly, what an amazing covenant of grace that God has brought you and I into. We will think of that shortly. Just very quickly, the chapter, it begins with blessing. But sadly, it ends with a curse. You see, they may be in a new world, but the impact of the sinful nature is still there. And we have to think forward to a coming day in Revelation 21, it's verse 5, when God will truly say, the former things have passed away. I have made all things new. Be encouraged tonight. We are still in a corrupted world, but we have a glorious guarantee and a glorious hope because the God of Noah will become the God of that wonderful eternal state for every one of us. The chapter clearly divides into three sections. We have right at the start here from verse one down to verse seven, we have God's blessing and instructions. He blesses and he instructs. But then in the second section from verse eight down to verse 17, we see God's covenant, his promise with man and not just with man. Very definitively, it said every other life form. This is his covenant. And then the last section from verse 18 down to verse 28, Noah's sin and his sons. Right in the first section, we find God's heart and desire. You see, God is the source of blessing. He loves to bless abundantly. Never allow the world to take that away from you. In its lies and deception, true blessing comes from God. He is the source of all true blessing. That's his person. That's his character. Here we may think, well, what's the reason for the blessing? And I would suggest two things quickly. Well, they're in a new world. And God loves to bless anything new. How about you and I today? We have entered into a new relationship with Christ. And the New Testament is clear. Ephesians 1 verse 3. We have been blessed abundantly. With material blessings? No with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, in Christ. Immediately you're saved. You are blessed abundantly. It may secondly be the result of Noah's dedication at the end of chapter 8. He's built an altar. He's offered burnt offerings. And we know from Scripture, every act of devotion to God always is reciprocated by his blessing. I'd love to take you to Psalm 84. It's in your notes. Read verse 10 to 12 of that psalm. As the psalmist is rejoicing of being in the presence of God, to everyone praising and worship him, God promises to bless. That's his character. Right at the start of Genesis, we found when he created this universe and he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them every possible blessing. He's a God full of blessing. At the end of the Old Testament, you will know Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, to a rebellious people, if they return back to him, he says this, I would just delight to open the windows of heaven and what? Pour you out. The blessing. God loves to bless. When Abraham had that active devotion on the mount. In Genesis 22. God says in blessing. I will bless you. You see when God blesses it's different. Can I just give you a rendering. Perhaps a personal rendering of Proverbs, where we're told about the blessing of God. 
Proverbs 10, verse 22. When God enriches a person with his blessing, there is no sorrow attached to it. God's blessing on your life and mine comes free of any added sorrow or heartache. How about the world's blessing? Sadly, in our world today, every physical blessing usually comes attached with some form of regret. Because every worldly blessing does not have the ability to satisfy completely. It's only God who truly knows you and me, who can truly satisfy. Can I just remind each other tonight, what blessing are we going in for in life? The true spiritual heavenly eternal or the passing transient of this world. Christ reminded us in his teaching in Matthew 16. Yes, you can gain the whole world. That's a possibility. But if you lose your own soul. What a cost. The Apostle Paul reminds us. We should make it our goal in life. Our sole purpose to do what? to please him that is his desire against that background and i shouldn't spend long here let's keep in mind if god is the source of blessing satan is the total opposite to that he loves to divide he loves to steal to kill to destroy you see he's the exact opposite true blessing is found in jesus Christ. Interesting here, just as in Genesis 1, 28, God says to Noah and his sons, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. He gave that clear commandment to them. Now, I'll just make a quick observation without spending a lot of time on that one, because some people would still take it literally today that our responsibility as parents is to somehow fill the earth i wouldn't fall out with anybody i just make the observation the two times when god made that statement firstly to two individuals secondly to eight people who were the only humans alive at the time i prefer to take it in a spiritual way and we will see that shortly I don't really want to enter into the realm of birth control and how many children you should have in your family. I'll just make the comment that that is a personal decision between the two of you as parents and the Lord. That is your personal exercise. But just keep in mind, in that family context, God is not necessarily looking for quantity. And I say that against the African context where we've been for so many years. He's looking for quality. You see, from his perspective, better to have one child who lives for God than to have so many who turn their back upon him. His purpose in marriage is for godly children, Malachi 2.16. But let's quickly take this in a spiritual context, because the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, how does he want to fill the earth? He commissioned the disciples, didn't he? Go into all the world, to all the nations and make disciples of them. That's the true commission that you and I have today. And it doesn't matter who we are or where we are. We have the possibility, incredible as it is, of being involved in that amazing commission. You may ne never leave Belma physically, but in prayer. You can touch every corner of this globe. You and I can be a part of that commission because the work isn't done through the preaching. The work is done through the praying. And I won't go down that one. That's a huge topic. You see, when 3,000 people were saved in Acts 2, it followed 10 days of prayer. But sadly today, we do 10 days of preaching and just a few minutes of prayer. So important. And then, as God allows, 
he will bring you into contact with someone in your backyard or wherever it is you are. And you may have the privilege of pointing them to Jesus Christ. Paul, the parent in the faith, said to his son Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, against the coming judgment, he says, Timothy, just preach the word. In season, out of season, whether you're popular or unpopular, just spread the message of salvation. In verse 2 to verse 4, God adds this allowance, this instruction to Noah and his sons that now their diet is increased and they have further sources of food throughout the animal kingdom. He enlarges their diet. And because of that, he says, all of the animal kingdom will be in fear and terror of you. Can I just stop and say, God is incredible to you and me in our diet. I'm not thinking now on the physical level. God has given us an incredible spiritual diet. You see, he's given us his complete living word. And as the youngest child can probably tell me, there are 66 books here. Full of spiritual food for you and me. He hasn't restricted us. You see, we have history and all its teaching. We have positive and negative examples in scripture of how we should live. We have wise words in the Old Testament. We have poetry. We have prophecy. We have the life and example of Christ. We have the start and growth of the church. We have so much teaching in the New Testament. We have a full spiritual diet. But how much do I eat from it? You see, one of our challenges in our age today is very easy for me just to sit back and be spoon fed. Instead of taking personal time in the presence of God to study for myself. So important. We have a huge, rich diet here. And Peter says we should desire earnestly, just like newborn babes, the milk. Of the word. Now, I know I'm jumping over a point here, and I will just stop. It is a challenge. Why does God say here, you can have every animal for food, just don't drink the blood? Make sure you don't eat meat that is undrained. And there appears to be little explanation here. And the only pointer I will suggest is when you move further on into Leviticus, the offerings. Whose part was it? Was the blood the part for the priests? No. The blood was God's part. You see, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The blood spoke of a life given. And when that sacrifice was made, the blood was poured out at the altar to satisfy the holy righteous requirements of God for sin. And perhaps that is what is in mind here. There is the restriction not to take of the blood because that is for God in the making of a sacrifice. But let's move on. There's specific instruction here about murder. It's taken place before. But in this new world, God clearly says, man is made in my image. And therefore, his life is sacred. If a person is killed by an animal or a fellow human being, in either case, the source must be put to death. Now, that will be strengthened, as we know, in the sixth commandment in Exodus 20. You shall not kill. But I just want to bounce forward into the New Testament to a higher form of law. And if you read in Matthew 5, you cannot but see this incredible, powerful message of Christ. He says six or seven times over, you have heard it was said, referring to the law, but I say unto you. Christ is bringing in a whole new realm because it's so easy to point the finger and condemn. See what that person has done? 
We're action orientated. But Christ says, no, I'm interested in the intention, not the action. And just to be angry with someone deserves judgment. You see, God doesn't just view our actions. He views our thoughts. We say, I would never murder anyone. Well, have I been angry against that person in my heart? That's the start of the process. And we know God looks at the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. Psalm 139 Verse 23, 24, search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Try me and know my heart and see if there is any wicked way in me. You see, it starts in the heart and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's move on quickly to the second section, the covenant. And we find right here in this new world, God has a new covenant. Read through the verses. It's in your notes. Five times over, God confirms this covenant isn't just with man. It's also with every living thing. Why is that? He says in verse 11, it's the guarantee that the whole earth will never be destroyed in a flood. He says in verse 16, it's an everlasting covenant. So in a sense, it's still there for you and I today. And then he confirms about four or five times the sign of the covenant, the rainbow. Now, we could stop here for a long session on covenants. I'm just briefly going to draw a comparison between three covenants. You see, here you have a covenant in the time of Noah. And then I'm going to take you to the covenant of the law on Mount Sinai. And then thirdly, the covenant in God's age of grace just to bring out how blessed we are today with the covenant we have. You see, at the time of Noah, the covenant was confirmed with every living thing. In the giving of the law, the covenant was confirmed with who? The nation of Israel. In our time of grace, the covenant is confirmed with every individual Christian. Isn't that wonderful? You see, here... At the time of Noah, the covenant revealed God's faithfulness. But at the giving of the law, it revealed God's chosen nation. And now in this age of grace, it reveals God's church. Isn't that an amazing thing? The covenant today shines out the church of God. Now at the time of Noah, the sign that was given was the rainbow. The giving of the law, the sign given was the Sabbath day. And I could go down that route. I won't go there. But the Sabbath was given specifically as a sign to the nation of Israel. Three times over in Exodus 30, verse 11 onwards, read it for yourself. At this age of grace, what is the sign? It's the Holy Spirit in your heart. We've been brought from the Lord to the amazing teacher of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The blessing that came at the time of Noah, the preservation of the whole world. The blessing that came at the time of the law was physical and earthly if you kept the law. The blessing that comes to you and me today is spiritual and heavenly. You see, in terms of the law, let me just stop for a moment here. The blessing of the Lord depended upon the individual Israelite to do everything he would enjoy the blessing. But your blessing and mine today is so freeing and wonderful. It will never rely on you, who you are, what you can do. It relies upon Christ for who he is and what he has done. And so Hebrews 8 verse 6, for example, speaks about a more excellent covenant that is founded upon a more excellent work, the cross of Jesus Christ, that brings to you and I more excellent promises. You see, everything in our covenant today, read through Hebrews, it's far better, it's far greater, it's more excellent because it relies upon Jesus Christ and who he is. Isn't that wonderful? 
to be a part of that covenant tonight. Let me just say here in Genesis, in passing on this topic of covenants, we find the foundation of faith throughout the book of Genesis. It's the only basis for a relationship with God. So you then ask me, well, why then do we go to Exodus and go to the Lord? Well, you see, God is going to uplift the nation of Israel and say, I want to show to the whole world, even though I bless these people abundantly, they are still under the control of the sinful nature and in and of themselves, they will never be able to please me. The law is not forever. Read Galatians 3.19. It's to the coming of Christ when we're set free and we're now brought into the family of sons. You see, Jesus Christ said, the law was there until John, Luke 16. And he says now in verse 16, is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. We are incredibly blessed. The law is over. We have come into God's incredible grace where that is available to everyone, Romans 3. And I love those verses. I must quote them tonight. You see, we're not made righteous on the basis of the law. No, there's no difference. We've all sinned, but verse 24, we can all be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That work of Christ at the cross is sufficient, his grace and his power to set us free from the slavery of sin is there to redeem us. Isn't that a wonderful message? We are absolutely righteous tonight in Jesus Christ. And the New Testament shines out with that wonderful fact. You see, in this new covenant, God guarantees so many things for us because it's not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon him. Jesus Christ says, if I, the son, set you free, you will be free completely. Not, well, if you do this or do that. No, no, no. Jesus Christ sets us free. The new covenant guarantees we have peace with God. Romans 5 verse 1. It's a guarantee. The new covenant guarantees we have eternal life. He says, I give to my sheep as a wonderful gift, eternal life. And nobody can take that away from me. He says, nothing can separate us from his love. And he promises that our citizenship is in heaven what a wonderful covenant just before i leave that can i mention this in every covenant the sign was visible it was seen and we still see that rainbow today god's faithfulness for the nation of israel it was so visible for 24 hours they rested completely no doubt about the sign how about in your life and mine tonight? You see, the evidence of the Holy Spirit should be seen. He's called in the Gospel of John, the Spirit of Truth. And he leads us, chapter 16, into all truth. I think it's verse 13. Am I standing on the truth? Do people around me see truth in my life? And then the fruit of the Spirit. It should be seen. As the sign of the covenant. Let's move on to the last section. We're fighting time as always. The last section is a sad section. And you cannot be moved, but be moved when you read this last section. I'm not going to get so much into the three sons. It's kind of interesting the order they're presented Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It kind of suggests to us in terms of their birth order <clears throat> there is a different order there i'm not going to go through that that's in the notes and perhaps shem is presented first not so much he's the oldest japheth is probably the oldest and ham is the youngest because of his spiritual experience and that would be a great topic to stop on tonight you see when shem is mentioned let me just jump to verse 26 Noah says, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed. He doesn't refer to the God of Ham. He refers to the fact 
that Shem has come into the blessing of knowing the Lord, capital letters, the eternal, ever-present one. And perhaps Shem has seen in the life of his father that walk of faith, and he now imitates that in his own life. Sadly, Ham will see something else in his father. A father in drunkenness. And that is serious for every parent tonight. What example are we passing on to our children? We can deceive others. I can never deceive my three children. They know me for who I am. I cannot hide anything from them. If you want to know anything about me, speak to my children. And it's the same with every parent. We cannot hide from our children. And it's a huge lesson for us tonight. What are we passing on to our children? The other huge lesson here is this. The best of men are only men at the best. And we need to remember that. Here is this incredible person of faith that we would admire. He's walked with God. He's seen God work in an incredible way in his life, building that ark, seeing God's preservation, taking him through the flood. And sadly, he falls. And there's a huge lesson there for every one of us. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, we know it well. When you're starting to think you're standing, oh, that's a huge warning. You're about to fall. We cannot stand in our own strength. From no, we have to learn this key lesson. It doesn't matter about yesterday. That's past. It's today that's important. And if God gave you victory yesterday, praise his name. But today is a new battle. Today we need new strength and protection. And the psalmist cries out in Psalm 16 verse 1. Preserve me, O God. I'm vulnerable, but I'm hiding in you. It's the only safe place of protection in this world. What a huge lesson to learn. It all starts with planting a vineyard. And there's a big lesson there. Because when you plant something, there's always a harvest. And we need to be careful, and I speak to my own heart, what are we planting in life? The things we begin to do, where do they lead? What's the goal of that? Starting something may be very innocent, but it may result in a huge harvest that becomes a stumbling block in my life. Galatians 6 verse 7. Don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. Whatever you sow, you reap. And sadly, we see this in this man. Isn't it so sad? A man of great faith. He is the first recorded person in scripture to be drunk. Oh, that's a stinging lesson. May God preserve every one of us this evening in our Christian walk. I don't know, need to go into the details of drunkenness. I will just stop with a verse in Ephesians 5, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine that leads to excess, to immorality. That's the stepping stone. You see, when you inhale alcohol, it takes full control of yourself and it makes a fool of you. It's a mocker. It brings shame. But by contrast, for a Christian, we should be being filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to control us in our Christian walk and life, not the influence of something else. We have the best, the Holy Spirit. Allow him to control every part of our lives. There are so many questions here, and I've suggested them in our notes. We don't have full details what does it really mean without being insensitive? When it says that Ham saw his father's nakedness, is there something else behind that? 
Is there some act of immorality there? Why was it so wrong for him to tell his brothers? It's just the two brothers. And probably the biggest question of all, why is it that it's his son that is cursed? And that's just one of many sons of Ham. Why is it Canaan that is cursed? Those are questions, and I'll be very open. I don't have answers to all of them. I will just suggest this, because it's here, and we need to listen. What does the Holy Spirit want for you and I to learn from this passage? And I've suggested five points, and I mention them very quickly. Number one, clearly it was wrong for Ham to be in his father's tent. We would say in our culture today, he was in his dad's bedroom. Why was he there? What was he looking for? And it seems he has this desire to try and peer into his father's private life. You see, sometimes we just go looking to try and find a problem in a fellow person. And we just keep searching until we find something. No. Always seek to uplift a person, to praise and to bless them. Consider others better than yourself. Not always be on the outlook for a fault or a problem. Sadly, if you look long enough, you'll find one. Because we're all human. Secondly, it would seem that his reaction should have been sorrow and mourning. He's found his dad in this way. But he's almost gloating when he leaves the tent and says to his brothers, look what our dad has done. You see, the scripture is very clear. The true love should do its utmost to cover over another person's wrong, not to broadcast it. So rather than trying to hide his father's shame, he went to his brothers and he broadcasted the fact of his father's shame. I cannot stop, but I thought of a parallel in 1 Corinthians 5, where there is that sin of immorality in the church at Corinth. And they were proud and gloating about it when they should have been in sadness and repentance. How do we react to sin? Others have suggested two quick points that it's hard to understand. I'm no linguist in Hebrew, but when it mentions son, perhaps it's the grandson. And perhaps it was actually Cain and one of the grandsons that went into his father's tent. I don't know. I'm just throwing out the suggestion. And that is why the curse came upon Canaan. And the other interesting one is this. From the context of the Old Testament. In the context of the Jewish people. What land will they inherit? It's the land of Canaan, isn't it? And. Their Canaanites and so many other tribes are going to be forced out of the land because of their evil and rebellion against God. And you can follow that in the book of Deuteronomy. What do we need to learn here? I think a practical lesson. When sin is discovered in a believer's life in the local church, the last thing we want to do is to hang out our dirty washing floor to see. This is a thing of shame. I remember when someone was put out of fellowship when I was young. First time I'd ever seen it, the whole congregation wept. They were moved by the action and the sadness. They were all involved because we're one body. And may God give us the grace, Galatians 6, those who are spiritual in a spirit of humility, restore that person. That's the whole purpose of any action taken in the assembly. Isn't it interesting? The chapter closes. Noah lives another 350 years after the flood. Wow. <laughs> the Gilpins may think they're at the end of their life coming back to New Jersey. You never know. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, but isn't it incredible? God gave him another 350 years to do what? To encourage people to walk with God. To warn others 
of the reality of the judgment of God. And none of us know how long we have in this world. But God does expect us to do those two things. It's summarized as redeeming the time. And you can read that in Ephesians 5, 16, 17, Colossians 4, to make the most of the opportunity that we have left, to encourage one another spiritually, and to warn those who do not know Jesus Christ. May God bless our time this evening. Thank you.